Like. Okay, should be live now. Okay, so uh, good good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to our original thinking seminar at Alliance Manchester Business School. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Simon, uh, Dr. Simon Hayward, who is going to be speaking today. But before um, uh, we provide a, a more in-depth introduction to uh, Simon, I just want to go through some uh, house rules uh, before we uh, before we proceed. Um, so uh, just uh, please note that the uh, webinar is being recorded and streamed into Facebook Live and uh, LinkedIn. Um, also, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of Simon's uh, seminar. So if you have any questions that you want to uh, raise, then please um, put those into the chat box. I think also the LinkedIn uh, page is being monitored and, and the questions there are going to be posted in to the chat uh, box here too. Um, also, if we can't answer all of your questions at the end of this session, um, what we're going to do is to then um, try and answer them uh, after the event and put those up, uh, perhaps in a blog. OK, um, so and when um, we, we do uh, ask a question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to um, uh, unmute yourself and personally ask Simon the question uh, rather than me interpreting the question for you. Um, and also, finally, uh, there are a number of different ways in which you can um, organize your screen, uh, uh, but we recommend the best one is the speaker view, uh, which um, gives you the best view of Simon and the, the slides to which uh, he will be referring in his talk. So um, I'm now going to pass you over to uh, Professor Fiona Devine, who is the uh, head of uh, Alliance Manchester Business School, who is going to uh, introduce Simon to us. Okay, so thank you very much David uh, and welcome everybody this afternoon. Very pleased to see everybody across a number of uh, social media channels uh, to hear today from Honorary Professor Simon Hayward and colleague Professor David Holman. So this webinar is very much part of our original thinking event series which showcases world-leading research from colleagues at Alliance Manchester Business School. Simon is the CEO of Cirrus, a management consultancy focused on leadership and employee development and engagement. Cirrus was founded by Simon in 2010 and has grown into an award-winning consultancy with offices in London, Melbourne and Winslow. More recently, Simon has become the global head in Accenture's talent and organization business, leading the, the leadership and culture practice across the world. Simon and AMBS have a very long history, I'm pleased to say. Simon completed his MBA here with us in 1986, was the head of Alliance Manchester Business School's Global Alumni Association for many years, and completed his DBA in 2015 on distributed leadership. And since 2018, Simon has also been an honorary professor here at AMBS. He has written and commented widely on leadership and has recently published the second edition of his book, The Agile Leader, which I think some of you will be able to see in front of you there. Uh, and I'm delighted that for some time, Simon has been part also of our research community here at Alliance Manchester Business School. And together with colleagues in our organizational psychology group, which includes David Holman, Simon is currently collaborating on a research project looking at agile teams. Simon and David are also heading up AMBS's first management KTP, KTP standing for Knowledge Transfer Partnership. And unlike a more general KTP partnership, where business and academia usually join forces to develop um, a specific product or service, an MKTP, a management KTP, is built around uh, identifying strategic management-based initiatives to increase business effectiveness and improve management practices. Cirrus works with major organizations on leadership development and employee engagement, 
and working with it with AMBS, the MKTP will help it embed and transfer knowledge of agile leadership and team agility to support new ways of working. And this partnership will also look at how to develop and adapt training materials to address challenges brought by the global pandemic. Now, given Simon's wealth of experience in consultancy, working with some of the major global and UK organizations and his insights on leadership and agility, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what Simon has to say today. This afternoon, he is going to be talking about some of the dramatic changes that global pandemic has accelerated, such as hybrid working and rapid digitization, and looking at the very human skills, such as collaboration, that unlock the potential of new ways of working. He will address the business requirements for greater agility, for innovation and purpose-led cultures, and the implications for leaders and executive development. My colleague, David Holman, Professor of Organizational Psychology, will then join Simon to facilitate a further discussion and audience questions. And I'm sure you'll all be keen to get involved in the conversation. So without further ado, can I pass you over to Simon? And thank you, Simon, very much for joining us here this afternoon. Thank you very much, Vienna and David, for the introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be sharing this uh, session with you. And, uh, and I'm very proud of my long association, uh, which you mentioned there, Fiona, with Alliance Manchester Business School. Uh, I, I, I came to do my MBA when I was relatively naive and, uh, and hopefully over the years, some of that naivety has knocked off, uh, but uh, uh, it, was, it was a great experience and continues to be one. And, and, I, and I'm delighted that we're partnering on the MKTP as well to, to further research both uh, for academic and commercial benefit. Um, so just I, I'd like, as, as Fiona says, I'm going to explore some of the some of the interesting aspects uh, that I'm that we're seeing through research, but also through my experience uh, working with organizations around the world, particularly in the context of this post pandemic world of work. So uh, let me uh, just sort of walk through uh, just, some just to, to mention that some of this work started uh, as a result of my DBA. So the first book, Connected Leadership, was a. Uh, was based very much on my doctoral research. Uh, and then the Agile Leader uh, was a subsequent deep dive into the world of agility. So, uh, so just, uh, I, I owe a lot to the business school. Um, as we all know, uh, over the last 18, 20 months, the world has been in a state of the pandemic, the grip of, of fear and of dislocation and so on. But what we've also seen over the last 18, 20 months, as we know, has been an incredible acceleration of change, particularly that of digitization, uh, both uh, uh, supporting medical progress, but, but also more widely supporting a, the shifts in ways of working and global supply chain and so on around the world. So th this is th the context has changed dramatically for many organizations and some are responding better than, than others. And so this presents a series of dilemmas for senior leaders, executives, and, and, and managers through, throughout organizations. And so now we're part of Accenture. I, I'm getting a lot more exposed to the, some of the world's largest organizations with which uh, Accenture works. And, and just what's becoming very apparent is that many organizations are struggling with these new realities. So the accelerating pace of change uh, particularly technological change and, and the, the way technology enables uh, organizations to be challenged, the political and economic volatility that we have seen um, so, so much recently and, and, and continues to be uh, very significant in terms of the world trade order. Uh, obviously, the, the effects of hybrid and just distributed working on, on not only on the way the organization operates and the way it delivers value to customers, but also to the way managers need to reframe their role and how teams uh, can need to operate differently. The fast scaling disruptive startups that are, that are, are, are really causing major disruption to a lot of the world's more well-established organizations. The power shift from producers to consumers, the power of consumers I don't think has, has ever been higher. And this is in some ways related to the rapidly evolving employee expectations. People, people, people are empowered with the, 
with the access to uh, information and the transparency of information that the internet has brought. And then finally, areas around scepticism about the very ethics and the, and the efficacy of capitalism, I think are calling into question the nature of the enterprise, the nature of, nature of business, and, and is it sustainable? Um, and, and linked to that, the increasing demands uh, for business to be socially accountable. I only look at Primark yesterday announcing that it was going to switch its production uh, to becoming more sustainable by 2030. So the key question in all of this, I think, for all, for, for all manager, executives in large organisations in particular, is can they change and can they enable the organisation to change as quickly as they need to? Now, I've been working with Gary Hamill over the last few months, uh, the, um, the, the, the eminent uh, strategist and, and academic, uh, unfortunately from is a professor at London Business School, but he he's also uh, a, a, a partner of ours. And Forbes described him as the world's leading expert on business strategy. And we've been working together on 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 developing uh, a sort of a new approach to leadership, uh, which is really interesting and fascinating man to work with. So we here we've we together we've identified these three major challenges. If you boil all this down into three major challenges facing the, uh, the enterprise, it's uh, they're either too slow. They're left behind or they're not attractive. And too slow in terms of being too slow to change. Uh, they, you know, Charles Handy talked about the frog in the, in the saucepan many years ago, this sense of um, inertia and inability to respond quickly and therefore uh, being, being left behind. Uh, left, uh, left behind in terms of innovation and not being able to, to compete with the rapid production of new products and services from, from, from the upstart competitors that, 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 that are snapping at the heels of large organizations. And then unattractive to talent, unattractive to, take, to attracting, to, to being able to uh, bring in the best people and to reskill people so that they can adapt more quickly to the changing nature of work. So these are, these are three, I think these sort of seem to sum up uh, the real challenge that enterprise leaders are, are facing. And I think at the same time, they create a momentous opportunity uh, for those organizations to, to flip into a new world, to a new reality. But only, I think only the very bravest uh, will do so. And the first is around creating genuine agility in the, in the organization. So we're talking enterprise agility, talking about large organizations being able to move quickly and responding um, uh, to, to customer changing demands very rapidly, uh, which means that they need to eliminate bureaucracy. Now, bureaucracy carries great on bureaucracy. He's a, he, he thinks it is that the, the management system of large organizations that has grown up over many years is, is at the heart of the problem of why organizations are una, unable to change. And so we spend so much time in leadership development and in business schools training individuals, but actually it's the management system that is holding them back. You know, how often have we spoken to people who've been on wonderful programs, the S or, or wherever, and they go back into their organization and they're drawn back into an old way of working. It's the, it's the management system that is at fault, the bureaucracy, uh, the power dynamics, the processes and systems that are built up over time. And so what we need to do, and this, again, there's some brilliant Accenture research uh, about, uh, on this that, that, that's recently been published about pushing uh, everything to the edge of the organization in terms of decision making and responsiveness and capability so that it is closer to the customer interface and to strip down uh, the, the bureaucracy and the hierarchy. So agile advantage at a you know, radical uh, change to the way the organization thinks and operates. The second one around innovation. Uh, this, this, you know, this is, these, none of these, these are not exclusive, these are all related, but the, 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 the need to inculcate disruptive thinking. In, in large organizations, there is a group think and a mindset that we see time and time again that is actually holding back the, the levels of innovation so that people don't feel able, they don't have the psychological safety to experiment, they don't have the psychological safety to challenge authority, uh, they don't really, are not able to, are not encouraged to respond to the needs of their customers locally. Uh, so innovation goes down, and that, that which which creates increasing gap between them and and uh, disruptive competitors. And then in terms of the human advantage, which for me is I think at the heart of all of this, um, if if we don't have to shift organisations to be truly purpose led, we don't shift organisations to be um, able to, to to identify and demonstrate that they take their role in society seriously, 
um, that we, we, we're going to be we're, li- we're losing touch with the sense of meaning that that employee is looking for. So this culture of being human centered and, and valuing uh, humanity uh, is is key. And all, all the other side of this is reskilling, constantly reskilling the workforce because the jobs that are needed now didn't exist many of them five years ago, uh, and 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 the same will be true in the next two or three years. Uh, so reskilling and the ability for people to adopt and be willing to learn new skills is is a cultural issue in many respects. Um, just to give you a couple of a few examples. So Hire, which Gary talks about, is is an organization, a Chinese organization that has broken itself up into 4,000 micro enterprises, 4,000 micro enterprises, uh, each of 10, 15, 20 people. And they're all operating in a nodal structure, a network, which is driving huge levels of innovation. They've they've got they've stripped out the in all the managers were pushed into uh, the front line. And, and but it's all enabled by technology. Um, in terms of innovation, we work with Finastra, uh, which is a, 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 a unicorn in London, fantastic exponent of open banking systems and the ability for, organi- for banks, uh, new banks, to adopt open system banking and rapidly provide the same services as the incumbent suppliers. And in terms of the human advantage, Standard Chartered, with whom we work, they've made some really bold stands about the purpose in that, 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 that they serve in their society. And they've gone public, uh, for example, on Accelerating Zero. It's one of their three bold stands. So putting, using their funding and their market influence, for example, to introduce clean energy across Africa. So they've made it very specific, very public, and, and they're putting their money where their, their mouth is. So that, that, for people in Standard Chartered, is hugely uh, exciting and empowering because they believe the organization stands for what it says. So th- those are those are just of some of the opportunities that um, that I think are facing uh, leaders uh, in in the, in how they re- reframe their view of their enterprise. So what do leaders need to do in response to this? So in this context, in the post pandemic or the Still in the pandemic context of much, much more uh, rapidly distributed work, uh, reducing social cohesion. Um, for, for many people, it's uh, for, for, for particularly for knowledge based workers, uh, office workers who have been working from home. Uh, it has led to, uh, for some people, quite, dis- you know, quite a difficult working situation and for many, a much less social and collaborative working environment. But how do leaders now respond to that? And how do they respond to these fundamental pressures which I've just described? Well, I've chosen a couple of areas that I think are particularly interesting, although there are many others to discuss. But the the two I want to focus on are letting go and and the power of teams, team power. Uh, I think these are particularly in the world of leadership and management development. These are these are critical uh, to, 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 to being able to embrace these challenges and turn them into opportunities. So first of all, let's look at letting go. Uh, so this is about people feeling comfortable and safe. So they're making shared team-based decisions on how to achieve their goals. And they have the information, the tools, and the skills needed to do so. And uh, so this is about um, pushing. This is about pushing to the edge. This is about pushing, uh, enabling teams to be empowered and, 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 and pushing uh, decision-making in a way that, uh, that, is, that is stripping out the, the, the sort of middle uh, of the organization and pushing it out to where the service is delivered. Uh, and an example is uh, uh, we're doing work with um, with a major water utility in the UK, uh, which is not terribly high on the on the rankings of customer satisfaction, and re- having, they're having some real challenges in in changing the way they they think. Uh, it's been quite hierarchical, quite traditional, um, and, and 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 very you know, not very highly rated by its customers. Uh, they they have been we we've, we've seen. Some massive changes in the way managers have behaved um, and challenge, uh, challenging the old ways and the old assumptions in the way they're operating As a, because, they're, because they're adopting a coaching approach to, to their role. They're adopting a, a, a role now to enable their teams to, to start to perform, to enable their teams to come up with ideas for improvement, to enable their teams to improve the customer experience. But we had a real challenge for, for quite a while because the senior management commitment there was there was head there was head agreement from from senior management that they knew this was an important thing to do, but their heart and their and their gut said, "Don't give up power. Don't don't change the system because it's too scary. It's too risky. What if it fails? And what is what does it imply for my role?" So it took a long time to get senior management really committed to making these changes. And it was only then when they when they started to 
role model it and be that and be that change that other people started to have a little bit of confidence to take a few minor steps towards the changes and that's then it's then once there's we started getting seeing seeing some benefits uh, that that the momentum increased so it's really important that letting go um it's ironic really when we're looking at trying to disrupt the the hierarchy we have to start with the hierarchy i think unless you want a revolution so we have to have senior leaders willing to give up power willing to let go and step back step aside and enable and to take on a more coaching perspective so i think that's pretty 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 key uh so just just an example is netflix i don't know whether uh, whether any any of you watch netflix but it you know it has become um hugely popular and it, it grew up quick, uh, very quickly in the United States originally, and was and was very su- successful in the United States. Um, and uh, when when they decided to, when they wanted to uh, build the international organisation in Canada and Europe first, they decided to do it very differently. And they had a couple of principles that they they, they worked on. One was local first, so they put an emphasis on local first, so letting go of centralised control letting go of investment decisions and allowing local market uh, teams to, 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 to work. And then the other principle was radical candor and transparency, which I, I rather like, a bit of a mouthful, but actually it sums it up beautifully. Radical candor and transparency. So radically open, straightforward, honest. Uh, and then there was a transparency with data transparency of information, transparency about performance, which led to a a much higher level of trust in the organization and enabled local teams in various countries to make intelligent decisions because they weren't having to refer back all the time to head office to get approval. So so this is quite a, 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 it was a a, a wonderful implementation of letting go. Uh, And uh, I don't know whether you remember last year, there were the two of the Two of their biggest hits were Money Heist, which was a German production, and my particular favourite, Lupin, which was a French production. Um, Money Heist was the the most watched show for a long period of time in 2020, uh, when there were lots of people watching uh, Netflix uh, because of uh, lockdown. And Lupin was also in in, in the top 10 and one of the one of the best biggest successes of the year so just demonstrating the power of letting local teams make local decisions with with all the information with the transparency in the in the organization that that supported them uh no without the fear of making a mistake because there was an explicit expectation that people would would make their best judgment and if they didn't work that you know that was that was, that was probably a good reason and 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 they were trusted so the investment decisions to start to commission uh, programs was left to the local market teams. Incredibly successful and has driven incredible success for Netflix. So yeah, so it, it, it does work and it can work, but it's it's brave. AWS is an interesting example. Uh, Amazon uh, Web Services. Um, it's you know it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, at one level it's a it's a it's a multiplicity of teams, just like Hire, the Chinese example. A large number of teams all vying to. Uh, to succeed, all enabled to succeed, all given investment if if things were, if if their experimentation was working well, and then the ones that were most successful got get, get increased levels of backing. So it's just a great another great example of where uh, where letting go, pushing uh, decision making rights, and supporting those into into wider into the organisation uh, is a great way to create the level of responsiveness that addresses some of the issues we talked about earlier. The other one I just want, which is linked to this, is team power. Yeah, I, it, it's we, we I, well, I'll, I'll come back to the research I'm doing with David and the team in 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 the AMBS in a moment. But uh, we're focused on the, um, on the team as the as the unit of measure, and it and it's fascinating to see how the team has really uh, become, I think, for the, so many organisations, the main unit of uh, of production, the main unit of activity, uh, and rightly so because. If where teamwork is the norm, where people work on shared goals to achieve outcomes quickly and effectively, where team processes are consistent and efficient, uh, that tends to lead to uh, greater entrepreneurialism, greater innovation, more agility, and more satisfaction and engagement for the people working in the team. So team power is, 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 is the second area I just wanted to focus on. Um, and, and this is partly around within the team, uh, the, the coaching teams to have a high level of alignment, understanding uh, how people operate, what roles 
uh, should, how, how the roles fit together. Very often having a multi-skilled team so that teams can, can solve their own problems. Um, having high levels of trust, having high levels of interdependence, all these are important elements. Key to the leader's role is to coach the team to be effective and to stand back and let them let them crack on. Um, and the, to encourage these teams to be very focused on the customer. And it's very, very, it's very important that there's a strong sense within the team of both their own purpose, why are they here, what are they doing, and how that fits with the organizational purpose of why we're here and what are we doing. Um, and there's the direction, therefore, the strategic decisions that the organization is making can be played out in practice by the teams on a, on a local basis. So they have, in effect, a, a freedom framework within which teams can operate because they're clear about why are we here? What are we trying to achieve? What are our strategic priorities? What are our values? How do we operate? And how do we want to behave? And when all of that's clear, then teams should be should be free to, to crack on. And uh, uh, so, so this, it's a word to... Um, once you've got teams operating well, and, and agile principles come in here beautifully to give the teams the rituals, the routines, and the and the regular opportunity to 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 improve velocity, then then we've got a wonderful unit. And then we can start to think about how do we get collaboration across these teams. Uh, just in as in the higher example, how do we get teams to work within an ecosystem? Um, the the founder of Hire is trying to turn it into um, the, 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 the first large organization uh, for the internet age. He's modeling the organization on the same nodal architecture that the internet works on. So the connectivity between nodes needs to be transparent, open, and, 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 uh, and, and, and consistent. And then the nodes are able to operate in a, with a high level of entrepreneurialism linked together uh, through through this system. This is why technology is so important. And I have to say, over the last six months, it's becoming part of Accenture. I, I, my eyes have been opened to the way technology can, can radically change the way organizations operate beyond perhaps what I had imagined. It, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary how technology can enable fantastic shifts in the way organizations operate to be more customer-centric, devolved, uh, empowered, uh, and efficient uh, it, it, when deployed well. Uh, so technology is this enabler all the time that is providing the, 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 the control mechanisms, the coordination mechanisms, the, the type of structure that a, you know, a, that's an athlete needs. So if we think about agility, you know, athletes need to have balance and control and poise and strength. Part of that is because they've got a structure that works well and, the, and technology can provide that. In the 20th century industrial model, managers provided that and the hierarchy provided that we don't need that anymore so team power is is the way forward um, and an example of that is with yodel about two hours ago i had a yodel delivery um i was told about it beforehand the 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 the, the messaging was fantastic and i have to say it was it was it was it was a, a beautifully delivered service elegantly and 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 seamlessly put on my front door so perfect very simple. Yodel, three years ago, was loss-making, had the worst net promoter score and the worst trust pilot scores in the industry. And there were questions about whether it was viable as a business. So let me tell you what, what happened at Yodel. So we took, we took Yodel on a journey and we put into practice all the things I've just been describing. Uh, what was what used to be a very hierarchical, control orientated, low trust environment where people would, would were not really treated with a huge amount of, of respect. We flipped that on its head over a two, two year period and, and said we need to, um, first of all, but we, or the senior leaders needed to let go uh, and acknowledge that. And then we needed to put teamwork in place across, I think it's about 50 sites across the UK, distribution centers and, and local service centers. Uh, we need to put trust, teamwork, and, and, and agile ways of working in each of those sites. Um, and we worked with the site teams and site managers to, to, to enable them to, um, to, to, to stop trying to control everything and to start coaching people to do a great job, to, to stop telling people what to do and start listening to their great ideas, uh, to, to, to enable teams to stand up and say, if, if we just did this slightly differently, if, we, if I adjusted this, if we adjusted my route, I could be a lot more efficient. You know, simple ideas that started to play into the system. And if you'll see on this chart, this is, uh, we've, just, we've, we've been shortlisted for a couple of major awards uh, next week at the CIPD uh, and, and, and with Yodel. Uh, and 
Well, and this is this is the key slide in terms of the evidence. So their their trust pilot score was the lowest in the industry in 2018. And it, it, this is from July, I think, from when when we did the submission. July is 4.6 out of five. That's the highest in the industry at the time. Highest in the industry from lowest in the industry. And that's customer feedback. Uh, if you look at the graphs, the first two are about vo uh, voluntary turnover, i.e. people choosing to leave. And it went from 38% in 2018 to 3% this year. If you look at customer satisfaction and net promoter scores, so customer satisfaction went from, from 80, it wasn't a disaster, but from 80 to 90, um, and from a, a, a net promoter score low of 45 up to 65. So that's the turnaround that Yodel managed to make and, and what's been remarkable is that it's gone from significantly loss making to significant profit. Part of that is because they've become more agile and they have uh, become more effective in the way they operate. And that's and, but it's partly because the customer feedback is taken into consideration by their customers. You know, their business customers choose whether they use Yodel or somebody else to, to ship their parcels. And people are choosing Yodel because they know the service delivery, the customer experience, the doorstep experience is exceptional. So the, all of this is linked together to drive organizational performance, happier people and happier customers. So you know, the team uh, and the team routines that we introduced are, are just so important, uh, which takes me on to the research. Um, so the research we've been doing, and I'll, we'll come back to this a bit later probably, but just to mention, the, the research we've been doing with the business school has demonstrated over a longitudinal study over three, three, three different time points of research with some very large organizations internationally um, into agile teams. And, and what it's showing uh, is that the, there is a linkage between the leadership style. So if leaders empower, stand back and manage high quality relationships, if they manage a culture which is fair, and respectful and open, then that will imp is, 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 is likely to lead to improved agile team working. And, and agile team working has a, an impact on both the team's performance, the individual's performance, and also their work engagement. So it's happier people working better, more effectively in an environment where they've got uh, trust, uh, empowerment, and support. So what are the implications for all of this for executive education? Um, I think there's, there's a couple of things I'd just like to mention. This is a personal perspective, um, but I think the shift needs to move from and is moving from individuals to teams and to organization-wide engagement and education. Uh, it's, it's, it's no, there's no point in us continuing to educate individual leaders to, to, to be more empowering when they go back into a system that is, that is fundamentally not. Uh, it's just not terribly productive. So that shift to teams and organization-wide development, I think, is essential. And then the other thing is, I, I think the experience of education, of, of, of uh, ed executive education, um, uh, needs to change. So it's, it's more enriching and it's more engaging and it causes people to really rethink their whole mindset about the, the, their, their role in the enterprise. So yes, education is really important to help people reframe how they see their organization, to see the possibilities um, of, of what it could be. I mean, coaching is, 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 is highly valuable in terms of challenging uh, people to think differently and to then to act differently. Um, the exploration, emerging, emerging leaders in other organizations who are exemplars of particular characteristics to see new possibilities. Is, is, is really important. Yeah, an exchange between organizations and working within an industrial ecosystem, such as the, 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 the health sector, for example, which we're doing, is incredibly powerful to get increased learning across different types of organizations and to help collaboration between those organizations. Um, experimentation, so prototyping new ways of working, prototyping new ways of leading and testing it and measuring it and understanding how, how, it, how it plays out and getting other people involved and experimentation is key. And then finally, and something that I've really learned uh, increasingly over the last few months is the power of evidence, the power of data um, and insight and how data can really help us rethink how we, how we, how we, how we lead. So I just wanted to offer those as, as thoughts really at the end of this, the formal bit of, of the session um, as some reflections on how perhaps we can take executive education to the next level. 
So thank you. Um, so David, are you uh, are you online? Yeah, I am great. Well, thanks ever so much, Simon, for uh, a really fascinating uh, uh, talk. Lots of uh, really interesting uh, insights from your uh, experience as a consultant and also as a CEO of a, uh, uh, an organisation uh, yourself. So. Um, what I'm going to uh, do now is maybe uh, invite uh, um, uh, some of the people who have asked uh, the questions uh, to um, just uh, unmute. Now, the first one came from, and it was actually by Q87948DF. I'm sorry, your name your name isn't uh, on your uh, uh, um, on, on the chat. I'm afraid, but you had a, a question about. Uh, mm. Are we returning to small is beautiful? Hi, if you'd yeah. like to introduce yourself as well. That's Hello, I, another David. I'm David. I work in the uh, the business school. Only been working for two weeks on the new management executive program, so very apt. And uh, thought I'd be interested in what you had to say, Simon, as I was. So, coming to my question, I, taking the whole piece, and uh, I know you don't want me to say everything you said is great and wonderful. You want me perhaps to challenge some of the things you said. So here's my first challenge. Is, is essentially what we're saying, returning to what Schumacher was writing about 50, 60 years ago, that actually in your Chinese example, because I spent a lot of time in China working in the silk industry, um, are, is your, through your Chinese example, are we saying that actually organizations really need to, need to rethink their structural requirements and to take a very micro approach and to give people what I call the three F's, which is freedom, flexibility, and to act fast? No, I love that. Absolutely. Well, a great question, David. T I totally agree. I think, I think you know, the, 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 uh, the, the scale efficiencies that of a bureaucracy, of a, hier you know, a, hi a highly hierarchical organisation, um, in this day and age, are, are, are really, um, you know, almost from, well, they're not a thing of the past, but uh, they are... Uh, outweighed by the opportunities for greater efficiency and entrepreneurism by by the most smaller teams new core for example in the, in the us is a major steel manufacturer but it works on a very localized basis there's very little management structure each each plant uh, runs itself essentially so yeah and i think going back to small is beautiful you're absolutely right uh, i mean sometimes the best ideas are, are repeats of 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 a pre previous wisdom um, yes. And, and I, I, I agree with you. And I love your three Fs as well, by the way. But yes, I think small is beautiful. And so if large organizations, which you know, we're working with many, as I'm sure you are, uh, uh, can find a way to dismantle themselves in a way that is not losing the essence, the culture and the organizational power they've got, but de 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 um, decentralizes decision making and breaks up the, the control mechanisms and replaces them with technology. As, as, as control vehicles, then they can do what Hire has done and Nucor has done and other organizations have done to create more uh, distributed, more uh, entrepreneurial, but still coordinated uh, and micro enterprises. So absolutely, yes, I think that's, I think I agree. I mean, it's, it's easy to do with new startups, isn't it, Simon? Because you can, as, as you were saying, it's just, what do we look at the big global players? And you were talking about the, um, the water sector or the electricity sector or the NHS. They've all tried a variety of different ways. And maybe there may be commitment from one or two individuals at the top. But generally speaking, the human dynamic is I'm releasing my position, my status, my future, my pension, my ra raison d'etre through what is seen as in empowering these ta untapped talent in the teams yes one, one of the one of the biggest challenges we have with with managers who you know who who their career is built upon going up the hierarchy um for for them to dismantle that in some way and they, they, they have a crisis of identity really um that, that, that they need to go through to say i'm going to redefine myself i'm going to redefine my role and i'm going to perhaps value things that in myself that i didn't before and 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 let go of the thing that some of the the trappings the power the the status uh, uh, that i had previously valued so much but it's these these are deeply cultural aspects and symbols that that um it, it takes enormous organizational will um uh, to break that inertia enormous and I, I i i don't see it in most organizations i see them actually quite comfortable um 
tr troubling along. And but you know, the, the, again, the pandemic has brought reality to to home for for you know, for example, retailers and orga you know, some organisations have, have suffered terribly. But uh, they they some of them it wasn't their fault. But for some some organisations, they were just not willing to embrace digitisation in the way that would allow them to become more nimble and able to to operate on a distributed basis. And then the then the pandemic has really just accelerated um, the, um, uh, um, uh, some yeah, some some corporate failure. Okay, I'll let others. I could talk to you for ages, but I'll let others <laughs> have a bit of you. So it's have nice, a beer to sometime, you. nice talking to you. So I'll yeah, put myself yeah. on mute and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, David. Yeah, I agree. We could probably talk for hours here, but um, I'm actually um, on that question of. Um, uh, leaders coping with dismantling the hierarchy. I like your comment about um, to disrupt the hierarchy. We need to start with the leaders, Simon. I quite like uh, that one because uh, it is very challenging. You know, we need to challenging for leaders to um, disrupt this, the um, the systems that have created them in a way. And I just wanted to jump a few questions because I do know that Michael Spence had a, a similar sort of question about um, leaders being uncomfortable letting go. So I thought as we were on that topic. Uh, Michael, uh, did you want to ask a question to Simon? Michael Spence? Hello, I'm here. Thank you, David. I'm here. Yeah, it was a comment, really. I think it was just more to do with, I think, as, as, as in leadership, as a leader, I think, like you say, letting go is such a really essential part of that leadership role. But also one that's also very uncomfortable. I think I was going to ask Simon from your experience working with small and large industries and organizations. Have you any tips to try and how, how you try and adopt that cultural change so that that becomes more of a business as usual approach? Yeah, um, well, uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Michael. It, uh, it, it, it's very difficult for large organizations to, to reinvent themselves. And it, I think it takes real courage uh, and boldness and bravery and, and it, unfortunately, that often means bringing having a new head or new people who are willing to challenge the preconceptions that that have been prevalent in the organisation previously. So, it's not doesn't always need to be the case, but sometimes you see the the precipitation of change being caused by a new incumbent in the CEO role, uh, and it, without the CEO's support and their wide, you know, the executive leadership team around them support. Um, it's got to have to be a revolution other, if it's going to change. And it's, it's unlikely to be a revolution because organizations are not democracies. So, it, you know, unfortunately, often it needs a new, uh, a new head, a new way of thinking to, 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 to really challenge this. And then incredible guts and determination and persistence to see it through because the vested interests in the power hierarchy are, are, are clearly immense. So, yeah, it's, it's real boldness or a major crisis and the pandemic perhaps is has caused for that for some organizations. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, M M M Michael. So uh, we also have a, a question from Gabrielle Taboda uh, on uh, working from home. Is it the new normal? So Gab Gab Gabrielle, did you want to ask your unmute and ask your question? Hello. Yes, um, hi everyone. Just, uh, I wanted to ask, um, so Simon, you were saying at the, at the at the beginning of the presentation, uh, you know how the pandemic has triggered uh, acceleration and just major challenges, but also opportunities. And I was just thinking I wanted to get a bit more into working from home. Um, so I don't know. I've, I've seen companies that are kind of adopting that even now post pandemic or even after this pandemic is, is, is over, they're just kind of adopting this. Do you think there's any type of advantage in, in taking this? Um, do you think that many companies will adopt this kind of working? Uh, well, it's a great question, Gabrielle. And, uh, you know, as you say, there are some organizations, some very big organizations like Fujitsu and Siemens that have said work from home forever. Um, and and, and I, I, to be honest, I think that's premature. And I, I, I was reading a, a, um, a report the other week that, that was saying, you know, it, it, it's all very well asking people. Um, but we're it's we're still in a state of flux, and let's give it a bit of time before we make decisions, and 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 let's continue to ask everybody what what's going to work best. But let's also see how it plays out, um, because um, certainly in our research, uh, the impact of COVID, because our research was uh, started started just before COVID, and the second time uh, 
box was just after the first wave of COVID. Um, roughly 20% of the people we were, we, we were surveying were finding it really difficult because they had care responsibilities and, or, you know, or other domestic circumstances that made it a really difficult situation. And remember, we're only talking about knowledge workers, really, and people who, who were office-based and are now working from home. A lot of people never had that choice, you know, whether they're in care or services or, or health services or whatever. Uh, so, um, so, but for the people that it that has affected, I, I, I think there's a, there's a danger that the majority think it's great because the majority are relatively privileged and have a nice place to work at home. Um, and, and, or, or whether, or certainly the majority of decision makers. And I think that's a, that's really risky, uh, assumptions, uh, to work from. So I, I would, I, I think we should wait and see. I think, um, high levels of flexibility are going to be appropriate. I think the, the one thing that is really beneficial from it all is that the, the skeptics who said, no, you can't do that because, uh, whether it was switching over to new technology or letting people have some flexibility and freedom to work from home or, or, or trusting people to, to work well when we can't see them. All of that was thrown out the window and shown to be bunkum, uh, which was great because it's some, what some of us believed anyway. Um, but it, it, but I, 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 so I think we've got huge benefits from this in terms of high levels of trust and higher levels of um, ability to work in a distributed fashion. Uh, but whether that's sustainable for some uh, organizations or whether that's, that's suitable for some individuals, I think is really in question. So I think the jury's out. Great, thanks. Thanks, Simon. So we have a, a question on LinkedIn from Paula, uh, and I'm not sure whether Paula can um, ask this because she's listening on LinkedIn. So I'll, apologies, uh, uh, Paula, but I'll ask it for you. And the question from Paula was, how key is data transparency to building trust? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, pretty fundamental, <laughs> pretty fundamental. Uh, yeah, um, clearly there is, I mean, there, 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 is, there, is, there needs to be respect for uh, personal data and GDPR and 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 yeah, you know, there, there need to there's needs there there is a there is a, a um, there needs to be respect yeah for personal data and and uh, you know, certain things are confidential and confident you know, commercially confidential, but I think that the the greater the further we can move towards transparency. Going back to Netflix, you know they had high levels of transparency. It was a principle of of where there's that that they operate on. Um, the the more we can have transparency, the more people. Uh, are, are trusted with that information, the more, pe the more they feel trusted and, and the, the more likely they are to be engaged in their work and trust the organisation. And interestingly, now, our, our, our re the research Dave and I have been working on, um, informational justice, which is one of, the, one of the proxies for culture that we were using, was, was, was quite low, wasn't it? But, it was, it was, but it was this, there was a significant correlation between informational justice and team performance. Yeah, so if there is more informational justice, i.e. we're transparent and we share information uh, in, in a way that's, that's, that's helpful, that, that is actually can have a relationship with the, the, the performance of teams. So yeah, I would advocate trans, as much transparency as possible. Great, thanks, thanks, Simon. Okay, so uh, the next question posed was by Katie uh, Palomino. So, Katie, you had a question on um, the digital adapting to the digital wave. Okay, so uh, Katie, are you able to? Ah, yeah. Hey, Simon. Hey, David. How are you? Well, my question is focused because nowadays, I don't know if I'm the only one of the rest feels too that I need help from company as they, as they mentioned that they are more digital and a chat box answer me. And I, and I think this human warm will lose, how, how will be the, well, I, I consider that it's a concern for me because I want to work in a huge company and, but, if a robot replaces me, it's an issue that all the time it's in our minds. But how how will be this future, or what recommendation do you have for for us? Yeah, it's a great question, Katie. Yeah. I, I think you know, a lot of AI driven systems so far have been um, just focused on the machine and and providing a, a a user interface, which may not always be as perhaps as, as human as, as we would like. I think what's, what's happening now more and more though is there is a, what's called the human and, human and machine, uh, the collaborative working between human and machine, the, the, the looking at um, job, uh, role and job design 
um, so that uh, it can be the, the bringing the best of humans and the best of machines and and AI in particular to come to, to bring to bear. So I and and, and uh, a colleague of mine, the CTO at Accenture, has written a book on this, so which I read over the summer. So it's particularly interesting uh, right now. But it, it, I think the future is in greater working together um, between man and machines, uh, humans and machines, so that we get the best of both. And um, there, are, you know, there are there are certain things that the machines are incredibly good at. You know, um, huge volumes of data, learning from them, and what seeing patterns. And there's, there are elements of intuition and and human interaction, which human beings are better at. And if you can bring those two together, then you get a much better, improved experience. And whether that's in a customer interface, like in a call center, or whether that's in a factory where you need the the dexterity of humans and the and and the the automotive, you know, the the power of machines to to to, to move things and 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 provide efficiency uh, in, in 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 different aspects of work. The bringing together of humans and machines, and and it, and so the use of AI to adapt actually to the human with which the machine is working, I think is 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 really going to. Um, uh, become more and more common over the next few years and it, and it's very exciting because it's not about humans replacing machines it's about finding the best mix uh, and that mix will evolve rapidly uh, as 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 we know all aspects of technology are, are, are still on a on, on, on a non uh, non-linear uh, upward move motion so uh, yes it's um it's a very exciting future but i and i think it will get away from that slightly inhuman feel that you're talking to a machine anything simon Thanks. Thanks very much uh, for that. Okay, so our, I think we have a time for a, a few more questions. Uh, so uh, the third one was uh, from well, P S H P. Uh, so um, and that was on to do with uh, how educators as a business should prepare for these sort of technological change about AI automation and so on. So a, a related question here, Simon. So uh, would you like to unmute yourself? I. Uh, I couldn't change my name. Actually, this morning I was at a KTN uh, webinar just on AI design for businesses. So, I mean, embarrassingly, I'm from accounting and finance, but uh, it seems like a lot of the discussions is about uh, law firms and accountancy firms, uh, how AI is starting to replace some of their services. And um, it's not it's not very straightforward. For example, one of the comments this morning was like, they spent a lot of time tidying up data warehouses, uh, getting data dictionary. They spent a lot of time just to separate the numbers that include VAT and those numbers doesn't include VAT, do you know what I mean? And then all the legacy systems. So it's not very obvious to me that it's, it's like a magic wand is going to happen tomorrow or something. I just wonder what, what do you think as a business or, you know, Ed, business school or you know educator how we should see all these and then how we should change our respond in our research and also respond with our teaching I mean even our delivery yeah so in the last year of the COVID a lot of the teaching were done marked by machine because they are all online you know we have really been pushed into that situation uh, whether we wanted it or not yeah so I, I just want to see like whether you you have any feeling about how fast it might come at us? <laughs> well, I think it's fast. It's coming. Yeah, I think it's coming fast. Uh, whether 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 it um, comes fast into academia, um, I, I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to <laughs> hazard a guess. I'm sure. I'm sure. It, I'm sure it will, though. Uh, as you say, it's. Uh, it's in a way, it's been voiced upon all also all aspect all, all areas of life because of um, the change in working through because of the pandemic. I think what what I would say is that. One of our jobs, I think, as educators, is to is to use to help use technology and AI and, and uh, insight to enable leaders to see to reframe how they see their organisation, to see possibilities, to look beyond the current and and see the future, uh, to model what that might look like. Uh, we're doing quite a lot of work on a on a new program where we get planning to use um, digital twins to 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 model the organisation that we're working with and to be able to see it change. So if you did this, what would it look like? Uh, if you if you if you if you redeployed thirty percent of your middle managers into um, customer-facing or value-adding roles 
uh, th what, what would that look like? How could that, what, the, what would be the, the consequences, both in terms of customer experience and internal productivity? So uh, yeah, I think really exciting opportunities. And I, and I think in, in education, we're probably just, um, just starting to, to, to sample that. And I, I'm sure more and more opportunities will arise. But yes, really exciting. And, and, and it's the same with Agile. I keep saying to, to leaders, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a developer, but you know, we need to lean into technology and explore it, um, and just be comfort, com com sorry, comfortable with the fact that we don't fully understand it. But let's explore it anyway, because if we don't lean in and embrace it, it will it will cause our organisations to be behind, because people will take their steer from from their from their boss. Unfortunately. Okay. Thanks. thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, one quick last question, I think, before we uh, wrap up, because I need to keep things on schedule. And that was from um, uh, Felicia Toe. Uh, so Felicia, did you want to, it's an interesting question, I think, uh, and a good one to end on, uh, given that this is all virtual. Uh, so Felicia, if you're... Hi, Simon. I'm not going to have my video on because I'm actually based in Singapore. And when I have my video on, it affects my audio quality, so please um, pardon me for that. Um, um, so my question is, um, I'm a new hire manager and I'm working for a government-based healthcare organization. And traditionally I've been leading my teams face-to-face -face and I have no problem because there's a human connection. I go out for lunch with them. I take my team out for coffee and um, energetically wise, they see me, I connect. Um, the tricky part is um, even if I have to take my team out one-on-one -on -one for coffee and lunch, I need to seek my reporting manager's approval because of the pandemic, um, which added another layer of bureaucracy uh, and red tape. But other than that, I think my challenge is for the next six to eight months of my entire working life, I will be seeing my team virtually on Zoom every other day. How do I get my team to trust me? And do you have any tips and insight on what I can do virtually for them to trust me and to connect with me? Thank you. Oh, Felicia, that, what a lovely question. Thank you very much. It's a great one to end on. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah, and I, it's been a challenge for all of us over the last 18 months to, to maintain and, and, and build relationships virtually. Uh, I, I think a few, few things that, are, that I think are practical. Uh, the, the, the first is to, is to show some vulnerability and to not um, focus on task and expect to have everything prepared and, and to be wonderfully perfect all the time to show vulnerability um so i think is, is you know is a good starting point um the second the second is to demonstrate your levels of trust in people i think one of the from, again from our research one of the things that people have valued is the is the reduction in management oversight because of the pandemic because you know they're not being supervised on a day a minute by minute basis at their desk they're being trusted to work at home or wherever they're working from. So, but making that explicit, how much you do trust them, I think is, is, is really helpful to call it out. The third is probably around gratitude, um, showing, ex, you know, going out of your way to thank people and to demonstrate gratitude and to demonstrate that you value them as human beings and for their contribution. Because it's very easy to feel like I'm, we're on another Zoom call, we're on another Teams call. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just, in production mode i'm just in task mode uh and and to just to 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 to, to show gratitude for people as, as human contributors um and then the other thing i think actually somebody uh, mentioned this to me the other day about how well there's two more things one is create space at the beginning or at the end or some way in but typically at the beginning of meetings just for a bit of social contact just to find out what's going on in people's lives, because that's what we do naturally in the office. That's what we do naturally when we're when we're when we're co-located. Um, but that's not natural when we've got half an hour or we've got an hour, and then we're on to another one. Um, so just spending a bit of time, it, it may feel like dead time, but it's not. It's, it's hugely valuable time. And then related to that is if you've got a larger team, um, creating opportunities for them to to, to meet in small groups. 
So we every week we have a connect call where everybody in Sirius comes together and we often break off into small groups to say, right, here's a, here's a topic, you know, how are we feeling about uh, Accenture's new system on X or uh, how, whatever it is. And we'll just break into lots of little breakout rooms and there'll be four or five people, but it gives them a chance to socialize and also to have airtime and share their concerns and then feed them back. So just maintaining that the sort of, uh, it, almost simulating the ad hoc uh, small gatherings of people, uh, the water cooler moments, I think can be, can again, be, be really helpful. But yeah, there has been a, a social deficit through um, working from home. In, and and I, I don't really I think we fully understand the psychological um, toll that has taken uh, but on, on people and on teams. Um, it, um, but but yeah, the productivity may have maintained, but socially there's been, a, there's, been a, there's been a cost. So trying to replace that with some of the things we're talking about here, uh, I think helps. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I share your, uh, your frustration with, the, with not being able to connect with people as fully as we would like. Lovely. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Well, I'll show my gratitude. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Simon. That's all we've got time for. Um, and I just think uh, Fiona uh, would like to say a few uh, ending words. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, David. So thank you, Simon, and uh, for a great presentation there and, and David for facilitating the conversation and, uh, and for all of you in the audience for, for your questions for, uh, that's uh, facilitated this discussion. Uh, great last question, I thought, and um, really good to end on that and, and to reflect on, on many of the things that have been raised here today. Um, we do have a fantastic series of inaugural lectures uh, planned for uh, this academic year, 2021-22. So do have a look at our website and register if you can for other events. Our next original thinking webinar is on Wednesday, the 22nd of September. And that is going to be led by Alliance Manchester Business School's Professor Emma Bannister, who's going to discuss, are we what we don't consume? How negative or rejected aspects of consumption inform identity projects? So that sounds like a really interesting topic. And I understand my colleagues will now put the registration details in, into the chat box. So uh, do click on onto that link uh, and register there. So just once again to, to thank Simon, as I say, really delighted to welcome here today. Um, really thrilled that we continue to have that very long link and close collaboration. And thank you very much to everybody for joining us here. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.